evening, everyone. How are we doing tonight? I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, the Honorable Congresswoman Kat Kamak. Growing up on a cattle ranch in Colorado, Kamak has a personal understanding of hard work and dedication. In 2011, shortly before she graduated college, an Obama-era housing program forced her and her family to lose their home and ranch. After months of homelessness, she became motivated to fight back against big government and to become a part of the solution in Washington. Kamek has served as um, the representative for Florida's third district since 2021 and is the youngest elected Republican woman in the House of Representatives. In the 117th Congress, Kamek served on the House Agriculture and Homeland Security Committees, the Select Committee on Economy, and sorry, she is a member of the Congressional Baseball Team, the co-chair of YAF's Campus Free Speech Caucus, and a YAF karaoke superstar. Please welcome Kat Kamek. You, baby. <laughs> now it's a party. <laughs> no, I appreciate the, the napkin tossing going on over there. Appreciate it. You guys are from Texas, aren't you? Normally it's the Texas crew that stands on the tables and does the napkins and then something breaks. It's a whole thing. Yeah, it's a vibe. I appreciate it. How are you guys doing? Come on, I know you have way more left in the tank than that. How are you doing? There we go. That is the type of tiger blood energy that we need. We're heading into 24, we got a lot of work to do. Now, before we get started, I gotta know, I represent the Gator Nation in Congress. Where are my University of Florida people at? Thank you. I'm sorry. Is, I'm sorry, is that Florida? Oh, the JV team. You know, you know what this means, right? It's first down, Gators. Yes, it's okay, it's okay. That's all right, we call them the Free State, or the Free Shoes University. Um, no, but we love you, we love you, don't worry. I appreciate my Gators over here. I also hear that we have a bunch of folks from BYU. Wow, okay, so fun fact, did you all know that more CIA agents and spies are recruited out of BYU? All right, so notice to the whole room, these are your future spooks. So be nice, be kind, remember their faces, right here. All right, and then I saw some of the folks from University of Iowa. Damn. Whoa. You kind of you kind of just sounded like so I as was mentioned I play congressional baseball, congressional softball, all that stuff. Yeah. And the Republicans win. Yeah. But this year in the softball game, the uh, the end fossil fuel protesters showed up. You know, they stormed the field and they do all these crazy things. And I heard something that I had never heard before, ever. Like, I'm pro protested all the time, right? And I've seen some crazy stuff. This one woman, she loses her absolute mind and she does what you just did. Go ahead, do it for the whole, the whole room. I'm putting you on the spot, but girl, you got it. Do it, do it. Yeah, that. There you go. So this woman does that. <laughs> that was excellent, by the way. 10 out of 10 stars. Would recommend. Uh, she does that. And then as she's being drug off the field, she says, that is the Mother Earth battle cry. <laughs> now, I was equally confused and intrigued. But I had a baseball bat in my hand at the time. And... 
Capitol Police said, no, 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 Representative Kamek, you can't get closer. I said, why? I just want to have a conversation. <laughs> they didn't appreciate that either, but that's okay. I appreciate it. Thank you for being a good participant in this back and forth. Appreciate it. All right, so Iowa's in the house. We got the Gators in the house, BYU in the house, Texas in the house. Buffalo, I hear, has a big... Okay, okay. Now, I saw a bunch of people over here that had mullets. Who do you belong to? <laughs> They're making a comeback, you know. I, I, I didn't hear who, who was. Who? Now they're shy. Really? Really? Business in the front, party in the back, silent? I think not. Oh, 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 Mississippi. Oh, I thought you said Miss MS. Oh. Mm. We're going to talk after this. Listen, listen. If you don't know, the University of Florida went to the College World Series. LSU just happened to fail their way into the College World Series. And you guys did great. You guys did great. It was a wonderful game. It was, it was a great series. They ended up winning. Congratulations. But SEC, there's a lot of love, a lot of rivalry. We have a good time, so that's good. But I appreciate you guys being here. This is amazing. I love seeing this packed room because this is the kind of energy, this is the kind of turnout that we're going to need to win in 24. So real fast, just to kick this off, are we going to grow the majority in the House? Are we going to take back the Senate? And are we going to take back the White House down the street? Yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. And that's the kind of energy that we need, focused, laser focused. I feel like that Austin Powers movie, you know, uh, Dr. Evil, like lasers, right? Of course, now, I, and, I, and I, I know President Trump, and he's, he's a friend of mine, I adore him, but every now and again, I cannot say China without saying China, <laughs> right? Or laser. <laughs> I love that man. But it just, I, it, it, he, has, he has had that impact on me in that way. <laughs> but think about it. I mean, we have to be so laser focused because the left, they have lost their ever living minds. When they are doing the Mother Earth battle cry, like they're bringing that every single day. Every single day. I, I had a committee hearing a couple, of, a couple of days ago. The Democrats walked out. Walked out. You want to know why? Because I suggested that we play a video. A video. Let me give you some context. We're in there. I heard you guys heard from Dan Crenshaw a couple days ago, right? Okay. So Dan had a bill, and this bill was about health care and funding children's hospitals. And the Dems say, we're here for that, but, but there's, a, there's a catch. We want to make sure that we have money that goes for transgender reassignment surgeries for children that haven't gone through puberty, right? And I'm kind of like, what? What? That sounds crazy, right? It's crazy. Like, you're mutilating children. And so I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, like, that can't be right. And the left is saying all this crazy stuff. You know, they're like, you are being insensitive. You're being cruel. We're the ones being cruel while they're talking about doing these kinds of, of surgeries. And, I, and I'm sitting there thinking, how can they say that? Like, we, I don't understand. And they say, you don't understand how these surgeries work. You don't understand the process. So you shouldn't have an opinion on it. And I said, you know, okay. I'd been quiet up until that point, which is a shock for me. <laughs> so I raise my hand, you know, to speak. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. I don't understand how these surgeries work. But I have a two-minute video from an expert surgeon who does these surgeries. And I'd like to play it. All hell broke loose. Oh my gosh. It was like I was suggesting that we play an actual video of the surgery itself. No, I was actually just playing a video of an interview with the doctor. Now see, what the left didn't know is that this video had gone viral a week prior. And being the good millennial that I am, I'm always on Twitter, or I guess we call it X now, right? Does anybody on, is anybody on board with this X thing? No, nah, see... I know, I'm like, I just, it's like it was a rebrand, a rebrand for no reason. I, anyways, so I had seen this video. It was pretty, pretty shocking, right? And so they protest. They say, we don't want to watch this video. I said, how can you not watch this video? 
It's an it's a expert from your side who explains the whole process. And as you claim, we don't know the process. So why don't we be educated? A novel concept for Congress. Why don't we be educated? They start playing the video. They all walk out. They all walk out. Now, what they didn't see is that that surgeon had pink hair to start, which if you want pink hair, fine. More power to you, that's your choice. But goes on to say that these are irreversible surgeries. These are things that change people's lives forever, that they don't really know what the impact is gonna be in five to 10 years. This surgeon goes on to say that they never really get the desired outcome once they're done with the surgery, that the kids that they operate on don't have enough skin to actually make the stuff work. That they're trying to really figure out the ethics of how this all happens and goes down. So in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, he really just made the case for us. But what happens is it comes out that the Dems have walked out of this hearing, that they have protested, and everybody goes wild. Because now this surgeon and his, his interview has gone all over the internet, all over the news, and people are seeing for the first time Republicans, independents, Democrats, young, old, engaged, not engaged in the process, everybody in between, they're starting to see, holy smokes, this is how radical the left has become. Democrats 10 years ago would have shuddered at the thought of funding surgeries with taxpayer dollars on kids. And here they are standing up for it but they won't even have the nerve to sit in the room and listen to about what those surgeries are. That's how radical they have become. So all of a sudden everyone's like, whoa, what's going on with the left, right? Gets better the very next day. I'm in a weaponization hearing with Jim Jordan. Y'all know Jim Jordan, right? He's a pretty good guy. He's a good guy, really smart. And we're in this weaponization hearing and we had RFK and a Breitbart reporter and, a, and, and the assistant attorney general from Louisiana. There you go, I gave you a shout out. Okay, calm down, mullet. <laughs> it's good though. I like it, I like it. You got curls. Tell my mom, please. <laughs> We're gonna talk hair products after this, okay? <laughs> yeah, as you can see, I like curls. So we'll, we'll, we'll work on this. But anyway, so we got these witnesses in front of us, right? And the Dems are just tearing them apart. They're tearing apart their own candidate. He's a Democrat running for president, right? And they're just tearing them to shreds. They're just ripping them apart, saying all these horrible things. And I'm like, this is just so weird. It's almost like a surreal experience. And it comes my turn to speak, you know, and again, I'm a little wallflower. And, uh, the ranking member, Stacey Plaskett, she represents the Virgin Islands. She's sitting behind me and she had been so rude and so nasty, basically doing a two hour Mother Earth battle cry for the entire hearing. And I, I just couldn't help myself. And, and I said, you know, the ranking member said she's really concerned that we have people here in front of this committee that are talking about the weaponization of government, that are talking about the continued censorship of conservatives across social media, that she's deeply concerned. How dare we bring RFK and testify, right? That we're playing games. She's just deeply concerned. So I fire back, you know, I'm deeply concerned that you took money from the convicted sex trafficker, Jeffrey Epstein. She wasn't expecting that. <laughs> she wasn't expecting me to call her out as his political fixer and his tax attorney and all the money that she got for him and his compound where he assaulted and trafficked girls for years. And you know what she did? Nothing. She sat there and stewed. She did like laser beams in the back of my head, but what could she say? Because for the first time, somebody had called her out. For the first time, a conservative had come out swinging and said, we're not going to take it anymore. We're not going to sit there and be quiet and sit there with our hands folded and just nod our heads. No, we are in fight mode. This is the fight club now. And so the last couple of days for me have really been an indication, right? 
that the left is willing to lose their minds and Mother Earth battle call all day long because they think that's, that's going to move people. But what's moving people is when conservatives stand up, whether you're elected or you're an activist, you're a volunteer, you're a student, when we stand up and we push back, people are starting to take notice. I had, a, I had a, an interview today and they asked me, they said, so what happened in this uh, hearing with uh, the secretary of HHS, Health and Human Services? I said, well, to put it pretty mildly, you know, the Biden administration lost 85,000 migrant children and they can't find them. They have no idea where they are. And we called them out on it. In fact, I have a jar in my office of wristbands that the cartels make little kids and women and people wear that signifies how much you've paid, that you are in fact property of the cartel. And you have to wear it because if you cross the border without one, they'll take a limb. They'll take a, a finger, a hand. This is, this is all true. I've been to the border nine times. I've worked shift with, shift with uh, the Border Patrol agents. And I have seen the videos that they threaten people with of them doing this to children, to women. And so I have this jar of all these wristbands that get cut off once they get to the American side. Because it's like they're getting the chains off of them. And so every time I'm down there, I'm literally picking them up off the ground just as a reminder of the trafficking that is happening in our own country. And I say often, you know, the cartels, they are completely complicit, making a ton of money off of this. But you know who's really complicit? It's the trafficker in chief down the road. Yeah, I said it. Because he is allowing this to go on. He could secure the border in one day with the snap of his fingers, but he chooses not to. And people are suffering as a result. Both people trying to cross the border and the people who are in the communities that these folks land in. And so I hold up this jar of these wristbands and I said, Secretary, do you know what this is? This guy with a smug look on his face says, it looks like candy. I said, well, that was a really dumb answer. <laughs> so obtuse, so blissfully unaware of the realities of what everyday Americans are experiencing and going through, this man is a cabinet secretary. And that was his answer. He's lost 85,000 children, no consequences. This is the Biden administration at work. This is what we're dealing with. And so, you know, I, I'm in this interview this morning and they say, you know, oh, you had the secretary in, that must have been crazy. You know, at the same time we had a UFO hearing going on. Were you on that, that panel? I said, no, I work with enough weird people in Congress. I don't need to find out about aliens too, right? <laughs> Like, that would just be the cherry on this year. By the way, show of hands. UFOs real? Aliens real? Somebody in the back's got two hands up. <laughs> okay? I would say maybe, like, that's an eighth of the room. An eighth of the room. Wow. Interesting poll. Okay. <laughs> Well, she has been in Congress for 37 years, so, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Y'all are bad. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Oh, man. See, this is why I get in trouble. Exactly. There you go. They said they got the roll ready. I heard that somebody fell asleep during uh, Colonel Allen West's speech. was it? Somebody, where, over here? If he's asleep right now, okay, so literally we game plan this out at the table here. a game plan for you, man. I have a dinner roll sitting here that I'm going to pelt you with if you fell asleep. <laughs> Just for you. 
At the end, at the end, you'll have to come up and I'll autograph it for you. You can take it back and it, it can get moldy or something weird, but. <laughs> oh man, you should know better. You should never fall asleep during anyone's speech, to be honest, but especially a colonel. Really? You're brave. But I bring that up because I know how crazy these conferences can be, right? Like, you're exhausted. You're running from speech to workshop to breakout session. Like, I know, it's, and it's exhausting. Plus, you guys have to do the, the parties at night, right? Y'all are going out at night, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And I know karaoke's tonight, right? That's right. I don't know. It's a little past my bedtime now. Listen, you guys already know that my designated go-to song is Baby Got Back. Oh. Word for word. But I don't know, I, I, I even suggested, I might, if, if I'm still here, I might do a little tribute to our very own Matt Walsh and do, Man, I Feel Like a Woman. <laughs> but no, I, t I, <laughs> I know, you guys, you guys, man. It's late. I'm old. I need to sleep. When you get when you get to my age, I'm 36. Am I 36? 35. Am I 35? I'm 35. Oh my god. See what happens. <laughs> Am I married? Wait, where are you from? Where are you from? Did you hear that? Are you married? I was going to give her a green card. We could have gone around Harrods, Buckingham Palace. <laughs> Forget America. Come to the right honorable Great Britain of Northern Ireland. You'd love it. Oh, absolutely. No, okay, what's your name? My name's Kessa Singh. Okay. How old are you? 19. That would admit... <laughs> you know what that would make me, right? Cougar, baby. Guys, 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 haven't, haven't you all seen 90 Days Fiancé or fine? 90 Days Fiancé? I want a green card. husband is a SWAT medic and would kick your ass. <laughs> I think I heard like 47 Mother Earth battle cries in that whole period. <laughs> You're hilarious though. I like it. I like it. Bold. Very bold. You should never run up on a Republican woman though because we are always packing. Y'all are crazy. I like it. This is just like, my, my team back here, Adeline. Adeline, say hi. All right, she went to UVA. Anybody, anybody a who out here? There's one. There's one. All right, that's okay. She's back there shaking her head saying, please, Kat, don't do something stupid. <laughs> she, she is trying to keep me in check. But I know that you guys have heard policy for days. You've heard about the political climate for days. I want to leave you with something before we jump into Q&A that I'm not sure you may have heard about yet. And it's this concept of time. You guys are young. I'm kind of young. <laughs> and 35, not 36. Thank you for reminding me. 
But this concept of time really didn't sink in for me until I got to about 2930. And I started recognizing the importance of the dash. See, on your headstone, you're going to have your date of birth, and then you're going to have a dash, and then you're going to have your death date. And it's the things that you do in that little tiny dash that matter. That's your legacy. That's your contribution. It's not about how much money you made. It's not about anything more than how you used your time. Because at the end of the day, no matter if you're rich or poor or black or white or young or old or whatever, time is the equalizer. Every single one of us has the exact same amount of time in a day. And I think about the time that we are investing in trying to take our country back. Some people do it by going and voting, right? They do it for the midterms, they do it in a presidential, maybe they show up for a primary, but that's the extent of the time that they give to their country, to their civic service. Some people invest time in doing their homework on how they can support American companies or companies that support American interests, right? So they're voting not just at the ballot box, but they're voting with their dollar. Some people, they spend their time in public service, like my husband, firefighter, SWAT medic, that's gonna kill that guy. <laughs> <laughs> or at least have a very stern talking to, I should say. By the way, my husband, Matt, where's my mullet guy? He has a wicked awesome Fu Manchu. You should work on that one next. <laughs> yeah, the, I'm telling you, Fu Manchus are in. You maybe give yourself in the way of public service, law enforcement, a firefighter, an EMT, a medic, a doctor, a teacher. You might run for office, local, state, federal. You may serve our country and put on a uniform. But the way that you spend your time and the way you prioritize your time is what that dash is going to be. When you think about it, no matter what you do with your life, whether you run for office, whether you go into a career of your dreams, whether you start a business, whether you start a family, you have to remember that time is the equalizer. And when you think about our country and the opportunities that it has given, not just you, not just me, but every single person in this room, you need to remember that 25% of that time should be in advocacy and giving back. Because Reagan was right. Freedom is only one generation away from being lost. We don't pass it in the bloodstream. And when you think about it, many of us were raised with parents that taught us to love our country. Some of us were raised in households like me. I was raised in a Democrat household. My mom always respected military and law enforcement. And you know, she, she went and voted. But she didn't carry a Republican banner. She didn't really carry the Democrat banner. She voted for the person who she thought loved the country most and would do the best job, right? Everybody comes to this place from a different way of life, from a different background, right? But the thing that makes this country unique is that we're a nation of equal opportunity, not equal outcome. And it's that 25% of your time that you have to prioritize, that you have to give in every single piece of your life. So say you start a business. Get it into your mind now that 25% of your time with that business is gonna be advocacy for your industry, for your business. Because what's good for your business is gonna be good for your community. You wouldn't be the type of person who doesn't give back and be in this room. You guys are givers. You want to give back to the country. You want to give back to your community. So say you get into politics. Say you want to be in campaigns. Think about how you can actually really make an impact. Because I know this from personal experience. Keyboard heroes and trolls, they don't move the needle. Today we live in a system of entertainment and reality TV that is governed by algorithms, and half the time, you're being censored. There's a difference between fighting and fighting to win. 
You showing up here is fighting to win. Yelling at someone on social media, that's just fighting. That's just noise. And noise, you can tune out. I can tune out the Mother Earth battle cry. It's easy. But you can't tune out people who are knocking doors. You can't tune out the people who are making the phone calls. You can't tune out the volunteers who show up and walk in the hot ass parades. Holy smokes, it's hot outside. You cannot tune those people out. You cannot tune out the folks that get the petition signed, that intern in the offices, that answer the phone calls, that do all the jobs that are required to make these operations work. You can't tune those out. And when you think about that, you're thinking, man, I'm investing my time in fighting to win, not just the fight. And I know you all relish the fight, but if we're gonna take our country back, it's gonna take us putting all our divisions aside, whether you consider yourself a populist or a libertarian or a social conservative or a fiscal conservative, if you are a conservative, you belong here. And we have to stop telling other conservatives that just because you don't like one element of their position, one element of their platform, that they don't belong as well. Because in this party, we respect diversity of thought. We, in, we understand that that's what makes us the true freedom fighters. We aren't scared of differing opinions. It's those on the left, the identity politics, the check this box if you're this, check that box if you're that. That is a system of division. That is why when we strap up for all of the fights that lay ahead in the next election, you have to have that mindset. I'm fighting to win, and I'm going to dedicate my time to winning and fighting to win. Nothing else matters. And if all else fails, remember the dash and go Gators. <laughs>I know we got questions. We're going to begin Q&A now. Please state your name, school, and a brief question. Hello, Congressman. Uh, my name is Christopher Grijalva, and I go to a College of the Kennedy. call me Congressman. It doesn't, it doesn't offend me. Congresswoman, I practiced that so many times, and I That's messed okay. it up. You know what? It's okay. <laughs> um, anyways, so in the 2020 election, we were finding mail-in ballots and trash cans, bags, and all over the place, yeah. even, after, even days after the election. So my question is, what can we do in the 2024 election to ensure the election is safe and secure? Yeah, that's a great question. So immediately after the election, we formed the Election Integrity Caucus, came up with all the best practices from around the state. Because you saw what the left did. They wanted to federalize the elections, right? Nancy Pelosi came out. She wanted to publicly finance the campaigns. She wanted to do a six-to-one match where if you gave a dollar to AOC, the rest of us in this room would be responsible for coming up with six additional dollars. And I don't know about you, but I am not giving to AOC or any of those crazy people. So that was the first part of their plan. They also wanted to get rid of uh, photo ID. They wanted to get rid of um, uh, the age requirement, the citizenship requirement, all these things. They wanted 16-year-olds to vote. Now listen. I, I get it, we want to get the youth involved, but they are 16 year olds and we all know them, they're still eating Tide Pods, okay? <laughs> like, huh. So the problem that they were pushing for was a total takeover of our elections. And instead, we should have been pushing to really enforce the constitutional way through the state legislatures, right? The states have the time, they have the right for the time, manner, and place in which elections are conducted. But states, like Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, during the COVID, they had completely changed the law without actually following the law. So we put together this series of things that states should do and adopt in the state legislature during their sessions that would enhance the election integrity. Simple things like, I don't know, stop taking Zuckerbucks. <laughs> Shock. It's like they don't know that Facebook's liberal. The other thing, they should have stopped having political parties doing signature verification. I know that's shocking. 
right? And then something simple like every county in the country should have a notarized copy signed at the close of election day that says this is how many ballots you have. That way you can't add and subtract. Uh, yeah, simple. And so we sent that out to every state. We had 23 states adopt, and we still have a ways to go. There was a bill that was just introduced. It's called the ACE Act. It really reinforces all of the funding mechanisms to states that are doing it right and then really targeting states that aren't doing it right. But I'll say this. In 24, we have to be on our A game, and we have to chase ballots all day long. I'm telling you, this notion of we're telling people not to vote early that's ridiculous. I know so many people, particularly folks like my husband, shift work. What happens when he works on election day and he's running calls all day because people are falling out? It happens all the time. He votes early because of that reason. We have to encourage people to get out and vote when the way that works best for them. And we have to, in the campaigns, be the ones watching and chasing every single ballot. But that also goes back to campaigns knowing their win number. And again, you have campaigns that just fight, and then you have campaigns that fight to win. And those are the ones that know their numbers, they know their win numbers, they know what they need to have in the bank in order to get a successful outcome on election night. So there's a lot happening in that space. I think people are more engaged now. And if you have not signed up to work in a campaign, at a polling location, as a canvasser or a poll worker, you need to go do that. That's the other way that we make sure that we avoid fraud. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I am an equal opportunity offender, and I also recognize I can be offended, and it's fine. I'm not offended, though. Good evening, Congresswoman. My name is Brooks. I go to Florida State University. Go Knowles. <clears throat> we'll, put it, we'll, put it, we'll put aside the rivalry. Um, I do want to actually talk about something though, that does have bipartisan support now. Yeah. Um, Senators Hawley and Gillibrand have finally uh, co-sponsored legislation to ban stock trading for yes. people, members of Congress, which is great. Mm -hmm. It still allows them to trade index funds and mutual funds. Mm -hmm. I personally don't think that any member of Congress should trade any funds, period, mm -hmm. um, because they have a lot of information on industries. But I wanted to get your thoughts. How far should this legislation go to ban stock trading, one? And two, when will the House Republicans do something about this to make sure that all members of Congress can stop exploiting the American people and stop stock trading? Great question. No, I agree with you. I think it is absolutely ridiculous that members of Congress can trade individual stocks. Like, give me a break. I don't own any personal stocks for that reason alone, nor does my husband. Because the information that we have access to about individual companies, it's an unfair advantage. And anyone who says otherwise is being disingenuous. So for me, I am totally against members of Congress being able to trade individual stocks. I think that we have to actually tackle this issue one step at a time. Because what I have learned in my three years in Congress is we always go for the big kahuna. We go for the whole thing, and then we are surprised when it fails, right? And I've talked to my colleagues about this. I said, you know, what do you think about ETFs? You know, what do you think about mutual funds? And there's so many people that have them. And they're like, well, you know, I could see the case for individual stocks, and I can, but on this one, and everyone has a different circumstance. I get it. People come from every walk of life. If we can start with the individual stocks, I think that's the snowball effect that we need to get us over the initial hump that we can then start tackling all the other areas and potential waste, fraud, abuse, insider trading issues that we have. The fact that you have members of Congress today that even they have 30 days to record their transactions. We've seen Nancy Pelosi and her husband. They go out and they'll sell a bunch of Microsoft or they'll buy a bunch of Microsoft and then, oh, sh surprise, the biggest merger in Microsoft history happens and their, their stock rises. No one for one second believes that they didn't know that that was coming. We're not dumb, but it's incumbent upon us to demand it. If you haven't called your member of Congress and say, hey, I want you to co-sponsor the Stock Act, that's one of the House versions. I don't know what the name of this one is. 
Congress would come up with all kinds of weird names for stuff. What's this one? The name of this one? I don't. I don't know off the top of my head. I just know that. Um, what that Senate number is it? I don't recall. I just I, I saw it in a headline and I had read a little bit about it, but I don't remember the name or okay. the, the bill number. But well, call your member of Congress and tell them this is an issue that you care about. Get them to co-sponsor it. Let's get the ball rolling. I will tell you that the activism from people calling and, and checking in with their members of Congress, it's incredible. And it is the most underutilized tool that we have in the toolbox. So I appreciate the question. And that's your, that's your homework for the night. That's action item number one. There's more coming. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Congresswoman. Hi. My name is Al Morgan, and I go to Michigan State University. Go green. Ooh. Oh, lots of Michigan people in here. Okay. <laughs> How's my hair? I feel like it's gone flat. It's better than mine. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for being a strong conservative in the swamp of our nation's capital. But with these traditional conservative values in mind, mm -hmm. how can you defend your vote for the Respect for Marriage Act and your comments you've made about it? Didn't you ask Dan Crenshaw that too? Did not. Somebody did, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 I heard about that. <laughs> Always fact check your stuff. And in that same vein, the reason why I supported that bill is because one, it added six pages of religious freedoms that we've been fighting for for 20 years. And I'm a constitutional conservative. And that means I have to defend every single amendment. And when it comes to the 14th Amendment and equal protection under the law, I'll defend it till my dying breath even if I don't like it. I like your hat. Thank you. Is that a Look, Stetson? Uh, no, I wish. I got it in Dallas, though. Oh, so. nice. Somewhat authentic. Um, <laughs> uh, so my name is Zachary Freeman. I also go to Michigan State University. Go green. Whoa. Whoa. So everyone who has the bingo, you can mark off Michigan now. So on February 13th, a gunman entered my school and killed three people and injured five, including one of my friends. However, what can Congress do to ensure that gun control does not encroach on our Second Amendment rights, but also protect our schools, festivals, and hospitals? Great question. I'm so sorry. Your question is um, interestingly very timely. I had uh, two of the parents from Parkland uh, in my office this afternoon, right before I came here. And we were talking about school safety and what we can do. To me, and going back to the question that was just asked, you know, it's very easy for people to bend to whatever the popular will is of the time. But the Constitution, for me, it's absolute, right? For me, the Second Amendment shall not be infringed. Very clear. And so when it comes to this issue, and it gets very emotional because we've had some terrible, terrible things happen in this country, right? First and foremost, no one ever talks about the shooter. They never talk about the mental illness that is plaguing this country. They always want to blame the weapon, right? And we've seen violence through a means of, of all kinds, whether it's with vehicles, with knives, fists, hammers, guns. We have to stop attacking the weapon and start getting to the root cause, which is mental illness in this country. That's the first thing that we have to do. And then when we talk about safety, my husband's a first responder. I actually told this to the Parkland parents today. When he goes on calls to these schools, and I'm not saying there's like a, a shooter situation that he's responded to. He's been there when there's been a fire or there's been an alarm that goes off. They have to wait for an administrator to come so that they can get a key. How can we expect people to have a timely response when we don't even have the proper access systems set up? Very common sense. That's one way. Second thing is we need to invest in law enforcement. When you have an entire body of people screaming from a national platform to defund police, what do you think's going to happen? These people are sick and tired, and I know it because I'm married to one of them. He's sick and tired of being a target, of sitting there saying that his life doesn't matter because he wears a uniform, because he puts on a ballistic vest on these very dangerous call-outs. And we've watched as those, those friends of ours that are first responders have these very difficult conversations at the kitchen table. I know because Matt and I have had that conversation of, listen, you don't have the backing 
like we used to. And people are getting more emboldened to take on law enforcement, to execute violence on people. And is it worth it? For a lot of families, the answer is no. And they're leaving. So we have a real problem with retaining law enforcement. It's getting harder and harder to recruit law enforcement. And I believe we should have an armed guard or an SRO in every single school in America. Because the only thing that stops... The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And so whether it is law enforcement empowering and training our veterans as they come out of the military to defend our kids, I think we have a whole suite of options to address public safety in a way that doesn't erode our Second Amendment rights. It can be done, we will do it, while the left continues to erode our rights. So thank you. We actually do arm our teachers in Florida. Just saying. I don't know if y'all could hear it over on this side of the room. He said, you should arm teachers. I said, well, we do. <laughs> Great suit, by the way. Oh, my God. Okay, I was going to talk about it. <laughs> okay, first, hi, Kat. Hi. I can't tell you how grateful I am that you're here. This is really weird to hear my voice in this. Um, <laughs> I just recently got a... Can I do my vibe? Or, like, just a little thing? <laughs> okay. Um, I just recently got okay with being in a plus size body mm -hmm. and I know that you speak out about, about body positivity and my entire life I was told that it was wrong and I was taking up too much space and I've got like a really sparky personality anybody that's met me gets really tired of me like soon um, so I you know verbally and physically take up a lot of space and I was always told I couldn't and then not even a year ago I really got into Oh, I listen to so many podcasts, read health at every size, and realize, oh my God, first of all, I'm not going to die of a heart attack at 30. I'm also healthy the way I am, and I could also be beautiful and wanted by men, <laughs> and, um, which was a weird thing because I just never felt like I deserved that, and you being here, and when you came on stage, I was like, oh my God, one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen, and so if I could think that you're beautiful, that maybe, like, Girls like me could be beautiful too. And so I guess my question today is, what advice do you have for those other girls and young women out there who feel like they are taking up too much space when in reality they could actually be changing the world? So uh, if, if you guys saw my husband, you'd get a kick out of him. His, his call sign on the SWAT team is Bean. And I joke that he, he looks like Mr. Bean, but the sexy firefighter edition, <laughs> right? He's like this big, strong guy, super sexy. And it's just, it's funny because he's tall, I'm sure, you know, like it's just, it, we're, we're complete opposites in so many ways. Um, but the thing that I have learned, and I mean, clearly you guys know this, I mean, my go-to karaoke song is I like big butts, <laughs> right? You gotta have fun with it. The, the thing that I have learned over the years is, and, and this really speaks to, I think, even a bigger issue that you brought up. I have talked to so many people who feel like they have that imposter syndrome, right? Like, I talk to students, young people all over the country, and they're like, I don't feel like I should be here. Like, I don't belong here. I'm not this cookie cutter, you know, thing. And it, I just, I sometimes feel like I don't fit in. And that right there is when I tell them that fake it till you make it is a real thing. It really is. It really is. And if somebody doesn't like you, that's their problem, not yours. And whether you are plus size, mini size, doesn't matter what size, anything in between, you have a place here. And it's your voice that people are seeking out. Anything less than that, it's complete BS. It's all shallow. And when they attack you for your weight, and I'll tell you guys, I'll be honest, I get the comments all over social media. She's fat. She's ugly. She's this. She's that. And I'm like, just keep driving up my algorithm, boys. <laughs> keep it a coming. Right? The, 
The haters are going to hate. But that's, that's their problem. Something is broken within someone else when they have to attack you. That is something that I had to learn the hard way, especially in politics. My goodness. When you're on camera all the time and you got all things, I'm worried half the time, do I have a booger in my nose, something in my teeth, do I have toilet paper on the bottom of my shoe? Like, there are all kinds of things going through your head and at some point you just gotta say, you know what? I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna be me. I'm gonna be me. And you have to have that confidence and if you ever feel for one second that little bit of imposter syndrome creeping up, like, I'm not smart enough, I'm not, I'm not, connected enough, I'm not popular enough, I'm not thin enough, whatever it is that's going through your mind, you fake it until you make it and then you prove those haters wrong every damn day. Now I'm short, I'm five foot three with T-Rex arms, so I'm gonna I'm not gonna fall. Okay. So much. It's cute. I like it. This is gonna be our last question. Hi, my name is Luke Castle from Dallas Baptist University. Um, I want to like go back to something. Thank you. I got it from my new favorite store. It's Joshua's Closet. He's my brother. Huh. Um, as you spoke about in your speech, uh, we have a pretty obvious border problem, right? Um, and lately, I've heard a, a lot of opinions regarding both how we should approach the issue and which branch of government should approach the issue. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to get your perspective on how we build a good solution for today and for the long term, specifically which steps you recommend and which branch of government you think should shoulder the responsibility. Oh, great question. Uh, two parts to that. One, the, the executive branch, the, and this is what happens when you have an imperial president, right? Total out of whack article, right? Article one authority, all the, all the legislative authority is vested with Congress. We have a responsibility to make the laws. The White House, the administration, they have to execute the laws. What we have seen under Biden is he wants to make the laws, he wants to execute the laws, but he also wants to be judge and jury. He wants to be the judicial branch himself, right? He wants no accountability. That's called an imperial presidency, right? What we need to do is we have to have the administration secure the border. That's the first thing. Second thing, stop talking about immigration and the border in the same sentence. Two totally separate issues. When we do that, we lose every single time. Because as conservatives, we have struggled to message this issue when it comes to immigration. When we, being the party of freedom, start saying all these things about people coming across the border, many of whom, they, they're literally paying cartels, they're renting out their bodies, thinking that they're going to get some kind of deal. It's, it's a horrible, horrific situation, right? If we approach it from a very, very cold, hard stance of, we, we don't want anyone coming in, we're, we're denying our own existence as Americans. We are a nation of immigrants, right? So we have to 100% separate the immigration conversation from the border security situation. The administration could secure that border in one day. You know how they do it? They allow border patrol agents to enforce the laws that are already on the books. The laws are already on the books. But we have seen this administration cut their funding, redirect it, and then selectively enforce or tell them not to enforce certain parts of the legislation. So what we have done, it was HR2, it was a border security package that puts resources back into border patrol. Things like bonuses and retention bonuses for CBP. Hiring incentives to get more agents on the line. Currently, 80% of agents are off of the line processing. I've been in those processing facilities where they're literally just doing a quick cursory check, like, you say you are this person? And they're like, yeah, okay, sounds good. Here's a court date seven years down the road. You're being paroled into the country. Does anyone ever show up for that? No. Come on. So. It really is just a matter of political will. And you have to wonder, the administration has let six million people come into this country unvetted, unchecked, we have no idea who they are for the unaccompanied children, 85,000 of them are missing. And when the New York Times, liberal, liberal New York Times is writing stories slamming the administration over the fact that they're finding 14 and 13 year olds working in factories that literally have little court dates, you know that they're on to something. You know that the administration is on the wrong side. So we can make more laws to enhance border security. We can put more money into those resources through the power of the purse. 
But until we have an executive that is willing to actually do the job that they are constitutionally mandated to do and actually hold up the law, we're going to be stuck. That's one of the reasons why 24 is so important. Because President Trump, Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott, Vivek, any of them, they will shut that down on day one. I promise you that. Does that answer your question? Okay. That concludes Q&A. Thank you so much for your time. So I just want to close with this. Uh, I know we've had some fun. I've also gotten pretty serious with you guys. I want to thank you for doing the inconvenient thing of traveling to Washington. It is a million other things that you could be doing. Having fun, getting ready for school to start, doing an internship, whatever it may be. You could be doing a million different things, but you're here tonight. And to me, that speaks volumes. Success is built on inconvenience. If success were convenient, everyone would be successful. And you guys are doing the inconvenient thing of traveling to Washington, bearing the humidity and the heat, and the swamp creatures that dwell here, possibly aliens, we don't know. <laughs> Maybe we do know, I'm not, I can't say. That is appreciated more than you know. You guys are gonna save our country. You guys are gonna be the ones to inherit this country. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being freedom fighters. Now let's have a party. A Russian man claiming to hold top-level secrets about Russian advanced bombers has just turned up at the U.S. southern border, seeking asylum. The man claims to have been an engineer at a production facility over in the city of Kazan, and he says that he possesses top-secret information about the White Swan Tu-160, which is the most advanced bomber in the Russian arsenal. U.S. border officials, they interviewed the man, and they determined that his story was in fact credible and eventually passed him off to the FBI, who are still in the process of interrogating him right now. However, analysts have pointed out that the fact that the story was even leaked to the public is an indication that perhaps the American government is encouraging other Russians who also hold top-level secrets to also escape to America. And if you thought that was interesting, well then you should click on that button below this video and check out Epic TV, one of the best no-censorship video platforms on the internet.